Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Really appreciate every single one of y'all being here today. Um, as you can see behind me, I've got a whole conglomeration of different kinds of fishing lines, but today we're gonna talk about is monofilament still applicable today? And the answer is yes. And we're gonna cover everything about it, where its strengths are, where its weaknesses are, um, where you still see it on the front deck and tournament boats today. Um, it's got many, many pieces and places to play in the sport of bass fishing still today. We're going to cover all those. This is going to be a series of videos that I'm going to cover from fluorocarbons, braids. We're going to talk about all of them, uh, where they excel, where they're weak. But today we're primarily focusing on monofilament. Is it still applicable today? And the answer is yes. I'm about to tell you why. Monofilament. This is a Supernatural by Sunline. We are going to discuss a lot of stuff with me I'm going to use as props um, or Sunline. It's a company that I've worked with for a long time. So don't think that this is a Sunline commercial. So don't even start dropping them comments down there. That's not what this is about. Um, actually, especially specifically with monofilament, I'm going to talk about a lot of lines that I used early on um, when I was younger growing up. Monofilament is a line that, that a lot of us used growing up because we fluorocarbon wasn't available, right? It wasn't sitting on the shelves. Um, so caught thousands and thousands and thousands of fish with monofilament. The biggest thing that this stuff still has today to offer is, is budget, right? Um, in this world that we live in, in bass fishing, with things costing so much, whether it's tackle, rods, reels, fishing line, um, boats, elective, you get the point. Monofilament still fits that budget, right? So for a lot of guys, monofilament is the number one thing that they're buying and the number one thing that they're using, and I'm here to tell you that there's nothing wrong with it. Um, there are places that it doesn't excel quite as well. We're going to talk about those in this video, but there's also a lot of applications that it does excel and still lays on the front deck of my boat and lays on the deck of a lot of top tournament anglers boats across the country. All right, let's start with the characteristics of monofilament and what makes monofilament special and different from all the other lines that are out there. Um, like we talked about, number one, budget, right? It fits the budget of a lot of people. Um, one of the big things that's big with, with with uh, monofilament is, is it's got a lot of stretch, right? It's got a lot more stretch than fluorocarbon's got. It's got a lot more stretch than braid, obviously, has has even less stretch than fluorocarbon. Um, the thing that that allows is, is with the stretch, you know, over time with use, this line doesn't last as long on the reel. So, you know, I'm changing it a little more often. Um, with the fact that it stretches, my rods are just a tick stiffer, right? So anything that I'm dragging or something like that for hook set purposes, are gonna be a little bit stiffer rod than what I would use with fluorocarbon that has less stretch. And that's what that's allowing for is the stretch in that line. Also monofilament tends to be um, a little more supple. Uh, it's a little bit easier to handle and manage on a reel um, and casting purposes and things like that, whether you're flipping or making long casts, uh, monofilament tends to throw better, um, doesn't get kinked like fluorocarbon does where you know you make a cast, you get a backlash with fluorocarbon, you pick it out and then a couple casts later you fire and it breaks the middle of your reel and your bait keeps sailing. We've all kind of been through that with fluorocarbon. Monofilament doesn't seem to have that tendency. Um, it's a little bit better and easier to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Monofilament seems to be more buoyant, uh, meaning that it floats more. Um, this line gets up in the water column, stays on top of the water column. Um, and this is really where it still kind of excels today and you're going to see it on the front deck of a lot of guys boats um, Anything top water. Um, I still use monofilament a lot today for so like any type of walking bait a stick bait a spook um, a pop R um, Any application with floating top water um, You're going to see me use a lot of monofilament um, The only type of top water that I don't think that you're going to see me use monofilament on would be something that I'm constantly reeling like a buzz bait or a plopper style bait something along those lines I'm usually using braid uh, braid also floats floats actually more buoyant than uh, the monofilament is um, The fact that it is Buoyant more buoyant, right? This is one of the big things that allowed us to go to fluorocarbon one of the big reasons why we've actually moved to fluorocarbon um, is because of the line contact with the bait. I mean, if you think about on a long cast, you know, if you have a long cast out here and this stuff's floating up in the water column, you don't have the direct tie contact to a bottom bumping bait, right? Like a jig per se, or 10 inch worm or something like that, a Texas rig worm, something that you're throwing out there, um, you don't have direct contact to it. So therefore you don't have the same sensitivity and actually it probably gives the bait a little bit different feel. The buoyancy of this stuff was kind of the drawback, right? That's where it's kind of got a downfall. Um, anything that I'm dragging on the bottom, um, I wasn't as big a, a big a fan of monofilament. Um, flipping, man, this stuff was great. Um, some of the 25 pound test monofilaments out there that used for years and years and years were 
uh, indestructible, right? Like uh, they, they were really abrasive resistant, like you could put them right in the middle of trees, logs, lay jams, all kinds of snags, and uh, really got good at that. Like so if, we, if, you're, if you're a uh, true monofilament fisherman, you really like to slackline probably more like, more times than not. And what I mean by slackline hook set is it's like you like to drop that rod, throw slack in it, and then pull it back up, which is one thing that I love, man, because I, I love the feeling of being able to slackline them. Um, don't know why. It just feels good. It's like it's like dunking a basketball, I guess, when you're young. I don't know, but it feels really good to slackline them. I enjoy it. Um, and monofilament's really, really good at that, primarily because it's kind of got a rubber band effect to it. You know, whenever you set the hook, this stuff stretches and then it kind of pulls back. So it, it, it does give and pulls back and kind of creates a rubber band effect and really helps jam that hook home on some of those fish. Cranking anything that you're winding, cranking and winding monofilament still does a really good job. Like I say, it's got a little bit of stretch to it and you need to allow for that. It can be allowed for the same way that I talked about with anything that you're dragging, a little bit stiffer rod, right? That allows you to... Um, make up for some of that, that stretch that you have in that line along cast. Like I say, this stuff does cast really well, so it's a really good cranking line. There was a lot of guys for a lot of years, um, some of the top pros in the world still cranking monofilament, and there probably still are some today. Um, I myself stayed with monofilament for a long, long time. Fluorocarbon kind of made its progress and got a little better and a little better and a little better to the point where now I do crank with, with fluorocarbon. But I don't know that you're gonna see a huge difference in cranking with fluorocarbon as opposed to cranking with monofilament. Um, you may get a little bit more depth, um, but you can also change that by line diameters. All right, line diameters is a big thing, especially with monofilament. It is with any line. Um, 0.40 is kind of something I keep in my head because the 0.40 millimeters and the line diameter sizes is what you're really gonna notice that I flip with a lot. So 0.40 and bigger. So that's some really big line. Um, this line in particular is 20 pound test. Uh, supernatural, but it is actually a 0.370. Um, so there is no line size in the United States that's like standardized. So line companies from all over the world making different lines, um, they can put whatever pound test basically that they want to put on a line. Um, there's no standardized this, this has got to do this or this has got to break at this point. Different line companies came out and they would put, you know, the strongest 15 pound test line out there. You know, they bragged about how, how strong their, their 15 pound test line was. Well, if you looked at the line diameter size of it, it was, you know, it was over 0.4 millimeters. So it was as big as flipping line. So I know that it was 20, 25 pound test equivalent to a lot of other people's fishing lines. And they were basically just taking a larger diameter line and putting a smaller pound test on it. Does that make sense? Um, and so, yeah. It was strong. I mean, but you're throwing 20 pound test line, not 15 pound test. And there's still a little bit out there on the market today like that. Sunline tends to be a little bit smaller. So their 20 pound test is really more equivalent to most companies 17 or 18 pound test. Um, and I, I noticed that right off the bat. And, and basically you can finish all that by really paying attention to what the line diameter sizes are in millimeters. Um, it's a big deal. And it's, it's something that a lot of people aren't paying attention to. Um, if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty and fishing, and it's always about the small details, is, is really the secret to catching bass and getting bites. Um, generating bites, you can do it with just by changing line diameter a lot of times. And it may be that you're making your crankbait dive a little bit deeper. It may be that you're allowing your jig to fall a little bit faster. Um, smaller diameters also allow you to cast further. It's a big thing to think about, you know, um, learned on, on the Tennessee River many, many years ago fishing with big crankbaits in the summertime. The smaller diameter, while yes, it allowed me to get my crankbaits deeper, the main thing that really helped me get it deeper was the fact that I could throw some of that 10 pound test so much further. I could take the same crankbait on 15 pound test, put it on 10 and, and throw it so much further. Um, just because of the reel and the aerodynamics of the smaller diameter line, I could throw it farther, which allowed that crankbait to dive deeper. So um, while yes, the smaller diameter does allow the bait to get down there, it also has a huge effect on the length of your cast, which has another effect on how deep your bait gets down there. So that's something else to think about. We've talked about a lot of strengths that monofilament has. And like I say, it's still got a huge place in this industry. Um, the biggest weaknesses that it has is the stretch, right? The stretch and the buoyancy. Um, the fact that it stretches takes away from the sensitivity. Uh, you don't have a sensitive you don't feel every little pebble and rock down there like you do with um, a fluorocarbon bait. Just like what I talked about in a couple of my last videos when I talked about the future of the jig and the future of the jig was the tungsten, right? Um, the tungsten gives you more feel 
more sensitivity. Um, fluorocarbon does the same thing. And when fluorocarbon first came out, it was, it was obvious to me because I was fishing a lot of team tournaments when it became readily available on the market for us to be able to use on a regular basis. Um, when you're in a team tournament and you're fishing there with a guy next to you, then both of you are throwing the exact same bait, one on fluorocarbon and one on monofilament. And this happened to be the LBJ um, in the early, early 2000s. Um, it was like a seven to one bite ratio difference. Um, the guy in the front would get one bite to the guy in the back fishing behind him with fluorocarbon when it first came out. Um, it made that big a difference. And a lot of people talked about the fluorocarbon was invisible to fish and this and that and the other. And I don't know about all that. You know, the light reflection and everything that goes with that. Um, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't know anybody that's ever interviewed a bass. Uh, so that's kind of hard to disprove. But um, the fact that it's not buoyant, like this stuff right here is, the fact that it does sink and gives you direct contact to that bait not only makes it more sensitive, but it also affects the fall rate and the action of that jig. Like, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you looked at it in an aquarium that was 20 foot deep and you could watch it on, say, 15 pound mono and watch that jig on 15 pound fluorocarbon, I promise you that that jig's gonna have a different action to it than it does on that mono. It's gonna be a little bit quicker, uh, probably a little bit more lifelike, whereas the mono is gonna kinda of help hold it up and kinda of float, and that jig's gonna be a little bit more subtle, right? Monofilament tends to do a lot better in cold weather than fluorocarbon does. Fluorocarbon gets very brittle, tends to break. Uh, monofilament holds up very well in below freezing temperatures or, or close to uh, freezing temperatures. I live down here in Oklahoma, so I don't fish that much below freezing, but um, we do have some days that we're out there that our eye rods are, are uh, freezing up with ice because of our line coming through it. Monofilament does do better in those applications. So those are really the two biggest things that are drawbacks to monofilament over the modern day fluorocarbons is the stretch and the fact that it's buoyant. One application that I'll talk about that's really different, if you guys wanna watch this video this far and you've made it this far, um, I'll sit down and we'll tie a uh, FG knot um, I'll show you a really cool way to tie an FG knot. You may have seen it, you may not have seen it. Um, I worked on this knot a lot uh, this last off season in the winter time and really got this thing tied down. Um, I give him full credit, Ot Defoe on his, uh, his YouTube channel is by far the best knot. It's, it's the easiest way that I've seen to tie it. I'll show it to you right here. But what I was gonna show you is an application with monofilament that's a little bit different than what you've probably seen. So some of the applications that I'm thinking about using this in the near future in tournaments that I've got coming up with this monofilament is, is I wanna be able to use it with braid to a monofilament leader. And I'm gonna use this on a topwater bait. And the reason that I'm doing it is, is because the braid has no stretch, which allows me to give, remember we were talking about the action of the jig on the bottom and how it, how it acts different. Um, I think that was the biggest part of fluorocarbon and getting bites. I don't think it's the fact that the fish can't see it. I think it's the fact that the line is sinking and gives you a direct tie to that jig and gives it more action. I think the, also the exact same thing can be said with topwater baits. It's a big deal. Um, I think that the braid, whenever you're twitching that rod, gives it just a little bit more lively action and not so much slow side to side with a really long cast with a whole bunch of monofilament laying out there. So we're gonna take this 20 pound uh, monofilament right here, the Supernatural Sunline, and we're gonna tie it to 40 pound test braid. And we're gonna do the FG knot, and then I'm gonna use that to use with a topwater walking style bait. All right, I'm gonna show you the easiest way that I know to do this. And it doesn't take long, it's not hard to do it in the boat. I just set the rod right in my lap, right underneath my line in there, and I sit on it, and it kind of gives me tension, that's all I gotta do. You're gonna tie a loop knot in the braid. Just fold it over loop knot real simple it's going to have a little tag in i like to cut that off just for future knot tying you can put this around the handle of your reel if you want um, what i like to do is i use my rod it's got that little keeper right there that you can put like drop shots stuff on if your rod doesn't have that then you could obviously do something different you want a little bit of tension on it but you don't want too much you know about like that maybe a little more um, and that's all you're looking for so let's lay that there. Then you're gonna take either your fluorocarbon or your mono, whichever one that you're using at the time. This is mono, because we're talking about this uh, top water bait. Gonna take about 13 or 14 inches of line slack out here. And then I'm gonna wrap around my finger about five times. 
and I'm going to get about 10 inches of, of tag line is all I want. I'm going to reach down here and grab this. I'm going to lay this right over the top of it, and you're going to start basically a weave is all it is, above and below. And every time you do it, you're going to cinch, and you're going to pull this way. So that's kind of start your knot. Above and below, and then cinch. And that's why I've got it wrapped around my finger six times. Above and below, cinch. And then I do this about 10 or 12 times. Every time you go above, you have to pull and cinch. Um, I don't even really count. I just kind of go off of how long my knot is. See that knot starting to form right there? I like for it to be about, maybe about a half inch long. This is by far the best knot that I've used to put two lines together. And the biggest holdback is, is everybody's always talking about how hard it is to tie. And I agree. A lot of the other ways that I'd seen and tried uh, for years were tough. But this is not. It doesn't take very long. Just remember to put a little pressure on it each time you put one in. Now this is 40 pound braid with a 20 pound uh, leader. Okay, all right. Now I'm gonna take this loose and my monofilament, you're gonna lay, take this off your finger, lay your fluorocarbon up the, up the line along with beside your braid. Try to get this centered in the screen here. Okay, so then you're just gonna loop over, back under, and put the knot and tighten it down. You're going over both lines when you do this. You're going over your monofilament and over your, see how that's over both of them? Tighten them down and then take the fluorocarbon or monofilament out of the equation and do the same thing but just over the braid and you're going to be done. It's that simple. We're going to do this one, two, three times. Pull them down tight. Get your little scissors. You can cut it as short as you want to cut it. So you don't have any tag ends at all. So there's my braid cut. Now we're going to cut the tag to the monofilament. And that's your FG knot. Just like that. I mean, this thing is ready to rock. I mean, it's, it's the knot, dude. No doubt. And, uh, that's not the best looking one I've ever done by any means, but it'll get the job done. And it'll slide through the guides uh, a lot easier than a lot of the other knots, just a lot smaller diameter knot. Um, so that's the easiest way I know to show you to tie that. Um, like I say, it works really good. It's something that I wanna be able to do with a top water bait. It's not something that you see every day. Um, give that bait a little bit more action, but not have that braid tied straight to it in some of the clear water presentations where the fish are looking up and they can really see everything that's going on. I've caught plenty of fish with braid tied straight to it as well, but uh, something to think about. And uh, this is something I'm definitely going to work with and fish with this year, this fall. So I uh, hope this helped you guys out. I will put all the stuff down below. You guys got any information whatsoever, please leave all the comments. That's how we all learn. I learn from your guys' feedback as well as you guys do from my videos. Until next time, I'm out of here.